right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Miko Getchev. I'm a senior engineer in the Angular team at Google. I'm truly excited to be here today. This is my first Angular Connect as part of the Angular team. I've been here about five years ago where I talked about aspect-oriented programming, and today we're going to discuss a couple of other topics. We're going to primarily focus on performance and tooling, but we're also going to mention the Angular's involvement in pushing the web forward with web standards. So let us get started. The agenda for today, as I mentioned, we're going to discuss Angular, Angular uh, the web platform, and our effort in the standardization, our connection with this 39 and W3C. We're also going to discuss automating the development experience by using schematics, enabling best practices, enabling extensibility with the new Builders API. We're going to look at some specific examples. And finally, we're going to discuss Bazel and how you can build at scale. Very quick disclaimer before I keep going. So I'm in uh, the process of losing my voice. So if you stop hearing me at some point, it's probably not going to be a technical problem. Cool. So uh, let us get started with TC39 and W3C first. Often when I talk to developers, it seems that people have the impression that we're working in isolation without collaborating with the other parties involved in moving the web platform forward. That's not quite the case. We have regular syncs with both TC39 and W3C. In fact, we were one of the initiators uh, who pushed decorators forward, the original proposals for decorators that uh, you're currently, in fact, using. And we're currently working with TC39 on providing the best the most optimal for the JavaScript virtual machine, and at the same time, ergonomic API that is going to allow you to uh, use the creators efficiently in the browser. So currently, very active in the standardization process are the different browser vendors. We have Internet Explorer, we have Chrome, Firefox. All of them are trying to contribute to the web platform by providing more ergonomic APIs, more expressive APIs, so we can build more powerful and uh, delightful user experiences. One of these browsers is, in fact, developed in the company where Angular comes from. This is Chrome. And luckily, we have a lot of intersection points with Chrome. So we're in a constant collaboration around how we can make the web faster, how we can provide more rich user, inter user experiences, and much more. I was just keying through the meetings know that we had over the past a couple of months. And we have been discussing how to make powerful PWAs. We discussed web performance, web standards, testing, and much more. In fact, one of the recent uh, deliverables that uh, we worked on together is web.dev slash Angular. In this set of posts, we are trying to help you to provide you uh, guidelines on how to build performance and progressive Angular web applications. This collection of posts contains information about how to build performant web applications in terms of improving the time to interactive, as well as the speed of the Angular change detection, respective runtime performance. We're discussing how to build more reliable applications by using pre-caching with the Angular service worker, how to make the applications installable and accessible. All the posts are in the same format. You have a bunch of content, uh, interactive examples in stack blitz, and some diagrams to help you get started faster. If you're particularly interested in performance, I would definitely recommend you to visit the performance optimizations in the Angular by Merck today. And if you're interested in the internals of Angular and the work that we have been doing there, definitely visit Kara's talk on how Angular works. All right, now let's talk about tooling. We have been working on making schematics the default standard for transforming and uh, transforming the files in your workspace and bootstrapping your projects. In fact, schematics can help us build more performant applications as well by automating your development experience by helping you to, to follow best practices easier. Adius Mani is publishing a regular survey on the cost of JavaScript. He did it for 2019 as well, and, well, still, the most 
expensive asset that we are shipping over the wire is JavaScript. So definitely we would want to reduce the number of bytes that we're shipping during the initial application load time in order to speed up time to interactive. Probably the most efficient way to do that is by using route-level code splitting. I bet most of you are familiar with this concept. You can use just load children in the Angular route declaration, and from there you can just load a particular route that is not going to be used immediately lazy. However, this involves, creating, uh, this involves a lot of manual steps. We will first have to define an ng module. We have to declare a lazy route. We have to declare a route in the ng module that is being handled by a component. And if we're following the Angular style guide, on top of that, we also have to deliver a routing module. That's a lot of steps that could be automated by using schematics. So in Angular CLI version 8.1, we introduced a command that is going to allow you to generate a lazy route with just a couple of characters. Basically, you can specify your module name, you can, spe you can specify the path that you want this module to handle, and your parent module. Let me show you how this works. So here we have an Angular application with a couple of routes. When we navigate to the about route, we can see that we have zero network activity. So there is absolutely nothing being lazily loaded in this particular case. If we want to move this route to a lazy route, what we can do is just go to the console, type ng-generate module, the name of the module, the name of the route that it is going to handle, and the name of the parent module. From here, you can see that we generated a new component, new module, and also altered the app module. Here is the lazy route that we introduced. Just a traditional standard lazy route, and now we can get rid of the eager route because it is no longer necessary for us to use. Finally, in order to move the functionality out of our eagerly loaded about component, we can just copy and paste this content to the lazily uh, loaded one, and everything from there on should work automatically. Now, when we go back to Chrome, and uh, we navigate to the About page, we can notice that the browser has sent an additional HTTP request over the network to download the About module, and from there, bootstrap the About page. All right, so this is just one of the examples of how we can automate the user experience by using schematics. We have been already applying schematics for ng-add, ng-updates to automate your migrations and uh, many others, including bootstrapping your workspace. But schematics can also help us to build more intelligent tooling. Schematics with combination with some constraints that we're setting on top of the application structure so we can extract some metadata about it by statically analyzing it. Now, in order to look at the next example, let us first try to use the application with the lazy route that we just introduced over a very slow network. Now, if we have a very heavy network latency and we navigate to the About page, you can notice that, well, the user may have to wait quite some time until they actually see the result. And we're putting so much effort in order to deliver desktop-like experiences in the web by introducing all this complexity of state management, progressively loading the application, and at the same time, we deliver pretty poor UX, right? In order to handle this issue, we can use preloading. So while the user was in the home page, we can just load in the background the about, the about module so that when the user performs the navigation, it could be instant. There are different ways to do that. We can preload only the modules associated with visible links. This is the so-called quick link strategy. We can preload only the modules that are associated with links that we have hovered over. Or we can apply probably the most advanced strategy out there, predictive prefetching where we're going to fetch only the modules that are likely to be needed next based on statistic report how users are actually interacting with our application. So this here, the tool that I'm going to talk about, it is more of a community-driven tool. This is something that uh, in spare time we have been collaborating with uh, Chrome, so it is not an official Angular project, but it provides a really good example of how by combining different Google services, we can provide more delightful user experience. This is the tool called GuestJS, and let us just introduce to our tiny example. First, we're going to use NGX Build Plus. 
This is another extension built by community, which allows you to plug into the Webpack configuration of your application without ejecting. After that, we can just edit the extra Webpack configuration that we want to alter our build with and introduce the guest plugin there. All we need to specify is a Google Analytics ID, a period for which we would want to extract a report for, and a route provider. This is something that we're going to specifically discuss in a little bit. Now, we can quit Vim and build our application by specifying the extra Webpack configuration. And this is going to trigger the build process that we're all familiar with. Specifically here, we're going to compile TypeScript, uh, we're going to concatenate a couple of our files and run the guest plugin that is going to require access to our Google Analytics report. Once uh, we provide read access to guest.js, it is going to build our application and introduce preloading or prefetching instructions inside of the individual bundles. We have been collaborating with the Google Chrome team, specifically with Adios Mani from there, and with the TensorFlow team in order to make sure that the model provides the, most, the biggest accuracy possible. So next, we can just serve the application and open it in our favorite browser. And uh, just uh, to verify that the prefetching is happening in the right order, we can look at the network tab and see that the about module and the NAND module have been prefetched uh, in the order specified in GuestJS, depending on the likelihood for them to be used. So how GuestJS works? It is just going to use a report from your Google Analytics. Uh, it is going to use a report from Google Analytics. After that, it is going to statically analyze your routing structure. This is only possible because of the constraints that we have set on how you can declare your routes in order to make them statically analyzable. These constraints sometimes help us provide better tooling for you. For example, types, set another type of constraints that could be quite useful. After that, we build a machine learning model which could be either a Markov chain or a recurrent neural network and prefetch the routes in the right order when they're needed. Regarding constraints, I would definitely encourage you to look at Rado's talk on power of constraints. He's going to talk there more about why we choose to use static HTML templates, what benefits other constraints, such as uh, type systems, can give us, and much more. Well, talking about constraints, another constraint that we can set is performance budgets. So we can restrict the, uh, we can, so we, we optimized our application, right? We use, introduced lazy loading, right after that we introduced prefetching, and our application is fast at a given point in time. However, we don't have the guarantees that our application is going to be fast in a week, week from now, or in a month. And big percentage of application's performance regresses over time. So budgets are a great way for us to improve this metric by monitoring our performance in a CI. So with budgets, we can set a given threshold for how uh, big our bundles are allowed to be. And if our build process, on some reason, exceeds this threshold, we can just fail our build immediately and investigate where the failure came from. I'm happy to share that in Angular CLI 8.2, we introduced style budgets for components. We noticed that a very frequent pattern is for people to import font awesome, let's say, in a couple of their components, which was increasing their bundle size dramatically. So in order to help you prevent that, we introduced some default values in our style budget. So if your uh, styles exceed given size, your build is going to automatically file. Now, let us talk about enabling best practices. Regarding enable, enabling best practices, I want to start this part of the presentation by sharing a small personal story about my first contribution to Angular. So in 2013, I was uh, back then, well, we had AngularJS. Uh, I was using it for building a single page application. And reading through the documentation, I noticed a very small typo in one of the interceptors examples. So I was really excited on contributing to a big open source project. That was, that was something that I tried before. Uh, before, before this moment and wasn't really successful. So anyway, I kept, uh, I forked the Angular repo, I uh, fixed the missing uh, brace, 
After that, I wasn't sure whether there was actually a missing brace, so I removed the fork triple. I uh, reproduced the example in my, back then it was just Fido, I believe, or uh, my local editor. I finally ended up opening this pull request, and I started refreshing the page constantly in order to see whether someone is actually going to approve it. So I spent like this a couple of days, and finally Pete, who is organizing Angular Connect, he approved my pull request, and it got merged into master. That was like a huge win for me. Like, I remember how excited I was that I did this pull request. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, that's not my only contribution to Angular now. <laughs> From this moment on, I kept contributing more and more, developed a couple of tools for static analysis, but it was kind of hard to ship big features because the, the team is following some priorities and uh, we cannot ship a feature out of nowhere without making sure what is going to, whether it's going, not going to have any side effects, for instance. That is why we introduced the collaborators program. With some trusted collaborators, we tried to improve the engagement, like uh, help, us, help, help them help us to build new features and guide them through the process. One of the active collaborators who played a really important role in version 8 in the CLI is Manfred Stair. Together with him, we worked on differential loading. So we started with this design document. After a couple of conversations with the Google Chrome team, we discussed what could be the most optimal way to implement this feature. And finally, we ended up with the implementation that can pretty much improve your time to interact with sometimes over 30%, depending on your application. This is one of the defaults that we try to enable. So this is going to, in version 8, we enabled it for all the applications out there. By using schematics, we transformed your project structure, we transformed your workspace files in order to take advantage of differential loading out of the box. Another research for enabling the defaults that we did was around serving. So we looked at HTTP archive, and we noticed that a lot of the Angular applications out there are not using content compression. Over 27% are not using Brotly or Gzip. And that's a very low-hanging fruit that can save a lot of bias to your users. We also noticed that even more applications are not using CDN. And a lot of these applications are used globally. So Probably that's another thing that you may need to consider. You want to deliver the static assets to your users from the closest node to them. In order to enable all of this in serving of your application, we started working on ng-deploy. ng-deploy is an initiative where we collaborated with well-established cloud providers and community members in order to help you serve your application following best practices out of the box. Here is an example how this works with Firebase. So here, in our Angular CLI project, we're first going to add Angular Fire. Angular Fire, uh, ng-add is going to trigger installation of Angular Fire, which is going to transform our project in some way. It is going to add some dependencies. And after that, it's going to connect to the Firebase APIs, where we can select a project that we want to deploy our application to. As a next step, we can just run ng-deploy and this should handle the rest. It is going to figure out what is the most optimal way to build our application and the most optimal way to serve it by using the specified platform. Once the build process completes, it is going to upload our assets to Firebase and we can go into, we're, we're going to get a direct link where we can preview the result. All right, so on this feature, we started early collaborating with Google Cloud and Firebase. We worked with Azure on ng-deploy. And uh, now I want to invite Muela on the stage to tell you more about our story collaborating on this feature and make you a quick demo. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, wow, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I want to show you uh, this little project that I'm working on, and I'll give you the presentation mode. Great. Oops, yeah. Wrong window. Where are we? Sorry for that. Terminal. Okay. So, 
We have here this very nice angular, where is it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, here it is. We're working on this angular application, and um, we're, uh, we want to host it. Um, it's, uh, uh, we're using static hosting. And like Minko said, uh, we're working on uh, different uh, platforms to deploy this Angular application for, and the Angular uh, team has been working on, uh, the, um, on, on allowing us some builders uh, uh, to add to the Angular CLI that uh, we can run the commands with and deploy it in two different platforms. And as I'm working on, um, on the Azure platform as a, an, a, a, as a cloud advocate for Azure, um, I decided that this is the way that I'll bring Azure closer to the Angular community. Um, so the project is called uh, Azure at um, NG Deploy. And you can find it on GitHub. Oops. GitHub. And it's published on M NPM. Okay. So you have everything that you need to know here. And of course, it's still under development. Um, and there might be some issues that you can help us with. But the, uh, the important thing is that you, that you can start working with it already. So how do you do this? Um, so I just want to show you the project. Project. Okay. Oops. No, this is what I wanted to see. Here it is. Okay. So this is a, an Angular project, and you can have routing and lazy loading, and you can have assets and everything inside, everything as usual. Um, then when you run, here's the app component. When you run a ng add at Azure dash, uh, slash ng deploy, okay. um, Right, existing. Okay. Um, it will ask you several questions. You can override the existing configuration. Let's try this uh, out. Okay. It will ask you to um, to log into Azure to select a subscription, and in its default mode, it will create the resources for you. It will create the resource group that we have in Azure for grouping resources, and it cr creates uh, a storage account um, where the application will be stored. And all the configuration will be found here at azure.json. All the name of your subscription, the resource group, the account, um, and also which project you're deploying and the target that you want to run before deploying. So the default is building the project uh, because we want to get the uh, build results with the configuration production. So you can also uh, change this if you have a different com configuration. Um, another thing that it does, it updates Angular JSON um, with uh, the architect. You see that there are different architects. Build is one of them, test is another one. Lint, and it adds the deploy architect. So if you're using um, Azure Deploy, then this is, um, this is what you're going to see uh, with the configuration in Azure JSON and um, the host is Azure. If you're uh, using other uh, platforms, you will probably see here some different configuration. And um, now from the newest version of Angular, uh, it's, I think, um, 8.3, uh, we have the command ng deploy, so we can just directly uh, run this, and hopefully it will run without many errors or bugs. <laughs> um, so like I said, first it builds it, and we've, uh, we've been thinking um, about how to do this, uh, how to uh, design this whole uh, tool of 
Yeah, and I have the error, of course. <laughs> um, how to uh, design um, the, um, what the tool does. And one of the things is whether, it are, we're, whether we're going to build the project always before we run it or not. And uh, we've been talking uh, with uh, Minco and the Angular team and also other people who are working on, uh, on different versions of this tool. And, um, oops, and we decided um, that, yes, we're going to have to build the project every time so that you will have always the latest version of it. Um, and, of course, there are also other things that we might, um, uh, we might use um, and we're waiting for your feedback on this. Okay, so I'm giving here some old, older configuration that's going to work this time. And so it builds the project, it deploys it, and now it gives you the link. Um, and it's just there on Azure. And you can all browse to this, to this link. Uh, the link is uh, composed of the name of the storage account, but of course you can uh, redirect it to your own um, a, a URL. Um, and um, that's it. It's, that's how easy it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you can find us on NPM, just Azure slash ng deploy. And please submit your, um, your issues, your comments, um, anything that you'd like. I have to uh, say that. This project is uh, being built and developed by advocates. Uh, so we're here to uh, hear your opinions and hear your um, issues and demands, and uh, we're going to talk to you about it. And we just want to make this tool really great for the community, because this is what we love to do as advocates. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody on the team, on my team of uh, cloud advocates who's been helping uh, me with this project. And um, the Angular team, of course, that uh, has been uh, doing their uh, work on their side on Angular and Angular CLI to allow us work uh, and, and on this wonderful thing that just helps us developers to do things better and faster. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shmara. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the demo. Uh, as uh, Shmuela mentioned, we have been collaborating with a couple of partners from the beginning. Not only big cloud providers, but also community partners, or a lot of open source developers out there. So another of uh, our partners that we're talking often to is the company Zeit. You may have heard about it. They are developing the Next.js meta framework on top of React. So we have ng-deploy to Zeit as well. We have been working with Angular Schule on the Angular CLI GitHub Pages deployment and Netlify deployment as well. Recently, actually just before I came to Angular Connect, I saw that someone implemented deployments to NPM. So if you're building a library and you type NPM and you type ng-deploy in the Angular console after adding this package, this is going to publish your library automatically. If you don't see your favorite platform here, however, Johannes developed an ng-deploy starter project. So you can just clone this, use the SDK of your cloud provider, and automatically uh, provide deployment capabilities through the Angular CLI. Now, let us briefly talk about the extensibility of the Angular CLI. In Angular CLI version 8, we introduced the stable new architect API, or Builders API. So the Builders API provides extensibility points to Angular CLI which allows you to implement custom functionality 
and it often involves development of ng add schematics in order to add this custom builder in your workspace configuration file. So often when you're developing a builder, you just need to implement a function that does your custom feature and a schematic that introduces it to your project. After that, you can just run it with ng-run, the name of your application in the workspace, and the name of the builder. Let me show you what another community member, Benjamin Dobler, did with this new feature. So we just, add, uh, we just create a new application first. We call it desktop app. So this is kind of a spoiler with what he did. Once we uh, install all the dependencies, we can just ng-add the rich apps ng-tron. This is going to perform, again, some transformations on top of our project structure. It is going to install some dependencies. And when we ng-run the desktop apps uh, build Electron, we're going to get a desktop Electron application directly that we can develop by using Angular and Angular CLI. There, are, there, there was actually a lot of creativity from community. We noticed that uh, a lot of people started experimenting with Jest, with Cypress, even building Node.js applications by using the CLI. In fact, most, actually all of the builder plugins are implemented on top of this architect or uh, builder's API that we talked about. If, we, if you want to learn more on how to enable your custom functionality in the Angular CLI, you can take a look at our guide at angular.io.guide slash CLI builders. Now, in the end, I want to spend some time talking about building at scale, and specifically Bazel, which could be used in the Angular CLI right now in an opt-in preview with the new Builders API. So most of you probably are already familiar with what Bazel was, but let, us, let me just spend a couple of uh, seconds, a couple of minutes, like talking about it. We have been using it internally at Google for over 10 years now. It has been building our entire monorepo. When someone submits a change list, a list of uh, files to this monorepo, Bazel is going to run the build process not only for the specific, specified changes, but also for all the affected other targets in the build graph. Bazel, in the same time, will be able to execute this build in the most efficient way possible by analyzing the build graph and distributing it among several cores or even cloud instances. In the same time, Bazel does not understand any particular technology. It is being augmented with different plugins. For example, if we want to build an Angular app, Bazel is going to delegate the execution of the compilation process to NGC or NGTSC, depending on whether we're using the current version of the Angular compiler or Ivy. A couple of open source projects that are using Bazel right now are Kubernetes, we have Selenium, also TensorFlow are using Bazel in order to build most of their C++ code base. We have projects from the Angular community as well, NGRX, and in fact we have been building Angular with Bazel for over a year now. Joey is going to give you more details in his presentation right after this one. So we're pretty fortunate to be in the same company with Bezo as well, and we have uh, established a good partnership. Pretty much every Thursday at 9.30, I'm joining a call with the Bezo team where we're discussing how to enable building your applications at scale. Currently, we have been investigating what would be the best possible way to do that. And uh, there are two main things that we're looking at right now. How to make it efficient for Windows, and how to manage the build configuration of Bazel automatically. So let me share with you what is the current layering, since I mentioned that Bazel is independent from the, tech, from the technology that is actually building. We have Bazel, that is our build, build tool, at the bottom. Again, it doesn't understand anything particular about given technology, although it can build C++, JavaScript, C, Objective-C, Kotlin, and so on and so forth, it is not coupled to any particular technology because it delegates the actual compilation to a plugin layer on top of it. These are the so-called rules. We have rules for Angular, we have rules for Node.js, and for TypeScript. 
On top of that, so now you already, by using only these two layers, you can already build your Angular application by using Bazel. You can use Bazel CLI, and you can configure your build manually by describing the build graph in the so-called build files. In Angular, in, uh, on ng-conf 2019, Alex Eagle announced the opt-in preview of the Bazel's integration with the Angular CLI. This is the layer at the top. So by using the architect or the CLI builders API, we're delegating the execution from the CLI directly to Bazel in order to handle your build automatically for you. So the news around Bazel are that uh, it is going to be released. It's version 1.0 1, 1 this month. The Bazel team is working really hard on making this happen. And uh, it already got wide adoption, but we're hoping that is going to get even greater adoption once it is announced as stable. Regarding the plugins for Node.js and Angular, we're still actively working on them. A lot of companies have already integrated them as part of, your, of their build process, but there might be some breaking changes eventually. And about the builder API and the integration with the CLI, that's how pretty much it looks like. We have the Angular CLI on top, which uses the builder's API, that delegates the execution currently to Angular DevKit build Angular, or when you add Bazel to your project, to Angular slash Bazel. Both tools, after that, are going to delegate the execution to a particular build tool, for example, to a particular like, compiler or another tool that is going to perform an action to build your application. So this integration is still in Angular Labs, and if you want to learn more about it and about the Angular CLI's integration with Bazel, I'll definitely recommend you to look Alex Eagle talk from NGCon 2019 about the opt-in preview of Bazel. If you want to follow for follow for updates around Bazel, I would recommend you to subscribe on bazel.angular.io or request support from one of our trusted partners. Often on events, I'm getting the question: Should I learn Bazel? And uh, people are often concerned because it seems that it's very complicated to start using Kangur. You need to learn a lot of things, and Bazel is just another one. In fact, you don't need Bazel in order to use Angular at all. Bazel is just a build system that is going to produce, product, produce product, production executable assets out of your project. So you don't need to learn Bazel, but it might be a good idea for your career development, for your growth as a software engineer. It has it provides you with a lot of great, good practices from functional programming implemented as part of your build process, where pretty much you have purity and uh, memoization everywhere in order to make sure that your build process is as fast as possible. So if you learn Bazel, it is going to teach you a bunch of good practices, and in the same time, you're going to create some reusable skills that you can reuse when you switch your job to a C++ developer, let's say. So as a recap, we are very fortunate to be able to participate in the process of moving the web forwards together with the different standardization committees. We're working really hard on automating your development experience with schematics, working on intelligent tooling, which can help us to take advantage of different powerful tools that can help you provide delightful user experiences, and enabling best practices by setting the defaults. Also, if you're interested in Bazel, please follow up on bazel.angular.io. Thank you. <laughs>